Hello and welcome to the University of Nottingham. I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Simon Oliver, to have a conversation about the role of philosophy in theology, and especially the role of Greek philosophy in theology. Simon, you were educated, at some stage anyways, into the movement known as radical orthodoxy, whereas my own background came out of um, the, what was called the Yale School, uh, a time when at Yale when the likes of Hans Frey and George Lindbeck and David Kelsey were going strong. And in many ways, we're very close to each other. We work in the same field. We share a lot of presuppositions. But there are some matters where these different backgrounds lead to quite different views. And, and one of the ones that I've been noticing for some time and wanted to ask you about was the role of philosophy in theology and specifically the role of Greek philosophy in Christian theology. So to begin with, why don't I let you tell me why this is an issue at all? Okay. The Christian theologians of the very early church in working out their doctrine, uh, the beliefs and practices of the church, had to wrestle with some very complex and difficult problems about the nature of God and who Jesus Christ was. And they were dealing with many different cultures. Uh, of course, principally, they saw themselves as inheriting a Jewish Hebraic culture, uh, and with that, the Hebrew scriptures that Christians now call the Old Testament. Um, but also, they were deeply influenced by another intellectual culture in ancient Greek philosophy that had spoken about transcendence, truth, beauty, goodness, issues that were preoccupying them as well. And trying to fit these two traditions, Greek, ancient Greek philosophy and the Hebraic scriptural tradition together, didn't, it didn't seem to be an obvious fit, particularly because the Hebrew scriptures are written in a certain, certain genres, so they're poetic or they're narrative. Uh, so we hear about the, the story, the history of a people, essentially. Uh, whereas Greek philosophy was written in the form of either dramatic dialogue or rather analytic uh, expositions, such as we find in people like Aristotle. So there didn't seem to be a natural fit. And moreover, it was clear that the Christian theologians of the early church felt that they had somehow been given a very clear revelation, a truth that could not be achieved by reason on its own. So the question then is, um, having received this very particular revelation, uh, this truth that reason could not achieve on its own, should they pay any attention at all to the work of pagans? So philosophers in the ancient Greek world were pagans and uh, it therefore wasn't obvious that Christian theology needed this pagan learning. Um, because they had received this very specific revelation. And so this double bind, as it were, firstly, on the one hand, these genres seem very, very different. And secondly, on the other hand, they've received this revelation, so why do they need pagan philosophy? Presents them with a problem. So the early church theologian Tertullian, for example, says, well, what has Athens got to do with Jerusalem? And Athens, of course, the city in ancient Greece, is representative of the Greek philosophical tradition, Jerusalem, uh, the, the focus of the Jewish people and, and Israel, the Hebraic tradition. But as time unfolds, it's quite clear that the two traditions historically had always been meshed together. Uh, so we find that already in the New Testament there are influences from ancient Greek philosophy, from Stoic thought, Platonic thought, in the writings of St. Paul, for example. Uh, and of course, St. Paul is also, he's a Greek-speaking Jew. He's, he's well-versed in the, the Hebraic tradition. So already there, the two traditions are bound together. And a lot of the early church theologians were educated in the philosophical schools of rhetoric, uh, Platonism and, and Aristotelianism. And they use this tradition to help them to, uh, to explore the meaning and implications of what the church professed in its teaching um, and what it all meant. And that principally meant utilizing the thought coming from the Platonic and Aristotelian traditions. So, um, so would you be talking about the Hebraic tradition and the Greek tradition in 
deliberately in parallel as two sort of equal parts with equal weight that you somehow have to merge or make use of or bring together? Is that a deliberate parallelism on your part? Um, I don't know that it's necessarily the case that one would have to weigh them against each other and find a 50-50 weighting. But I think it seems to me that Greek philosophy enables the early church to unpick, interpret if you like, what's already latent there within the Hebraic tradition that's made manifest in Christ um, and yet more explicit by using this uh, ancient Greek thought as well that all, always had intimations of what was revealed far more uh, vividly and salvifically in Christ and the Christian tradition. So I don't know there's necessarily a parallelism, they're, they're always knit together. Right. Okay. So I think almost everything you said I'd be happy to agree with, but I might then go on to say that um, if uh, other Christians found themselves in a different intellectual context with a different intellectual philosophical tradition or a different simply cultural tradition, then they would necessarily um, start doing something similar, but it wouldn't be Greek philosophy. It might be Confucianism or it might be... Um, you know, some African local tradition that there's that that my own instinct would be to say it's inescapable that you draw on some philosophical, cultural, intellectual tradition around you, but it's not inescapable that it has it, it was as a matter of fact Greek philosophy then because that's where they were. Um, but it doesn't mean everyone else ever after has to go that route. They'll have to go that route to understand historically what was going on in the early church, and that'll always be important. But I'm wondering whether you would want to say it has some more kind of, to put it melodramatically, some eternal necessity to stick with Greek philosophy. Right. Um, well, as it happens, I think that um, particularly in the Platonic and Aristotelian traditions that get merged in Neoplatonism um, rather later on, both pagan and Christian Neoplatonism, I think that there are aspects of, of that tradition that um, if you like, have a, a best fit with the Christian tradition, if you like. Uh, I wouldn't put it as necessary, I wouldn't express it in quite that sense, but uh, most fitting, most appropriate uh, companion to Christian theology in helping us to, to explain the meaning and implications of Christian doctrine. And I think there are a few reasons for that. One of them is that um, of course, the Platonic and Aristotelian schools that get merged in Neoplatonism are not, as it were, directly the products of two individuals. So what happens in ancient Greek philosophy is that um, Plato and Aristotle are both teaching at their respective academies. Their, their lecture notes, as it were, are written down by their students, are written down by scribes, and they're passed on. And what develops is uh, an oral tradition um, that has, you know, very, very wide input from over a very long period of time in the discernment of truth. And coupled with that, what we have in the Platonic and Aristotelian traditions and ancient Greek philosophy generally, actually, is a notion of philosophy not simply as a set of abstract ideas or even logical principles, but a way of life. So to be a philosopher was to be a certain kind of person in the ancient world. And also the, the, the third strand, I think, is that both the Platonic tradition and Aristotelian tradition, and then, of course, Neoplatonism, discern, I think, at their heart, a monotheism, essentially, or it's certainly a proto-monotheism. So what they're always focusing on is the importance of the one in relation to the many, and this, of course, has great consonance with the, the uncompromising monotheism of the Hebraic tradition. So immediately the other church theologians think the Platonic emphasis on the one, the Aristotelian emphasis on the first unmoved mover, the, 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 the transcendent being that is fully in act. And there they see a, a congruence immediately. Um, but what happens over the centuries from Plato and Aristotle is the development of this oral tradition uh, and of the schools of Platonism and Aristotelianism that are not simply 
as it were, verbatim repetitions of the works of Plato and Aristotle, but gradually accrue um, a unifying sense of truth, if you like. So the, the Aristotelian and Platonic traditions unify principles of truth, beauty, goodness, being, uh, uh, over a whole range of, of topics that makes them peculiarly well suited, I think, to be of uh, crucial and fruitful use in the exposition of Christian doctrine. And of course, this idea of philosophy as a way of life, the early church theologians pick up very quickly because quite clearly what the Hebraic tradition gives us is an ethics. It gives us a way of life. It gives us the law. It gives us the Ten Commandments. And Christ is seen as the culmination of that law. So the linking together of an intellectual tradition with an ethics as well is another reason why this ancient Greek tradition is so important. So I wouldn't have said it was uh, necessary because in a sense it's a, it's a matter of history, uh, but neither would I say that it's, uh, as it were, entirely dispensable or substitutable with another tradition. So you'd say that as a matter of fact, it's a particularly suitable, rich, strong, developing tradition so that to be committed to the continuation of Christian theology really ought to mean to be committed to the continuation of that tradition as well as to the continuation of you know, explicit reflection on revelation and who is Christ. I think so, but while recognizing that that tradition is, is a very rich and varied one, um, but I also think that um, if we take that approach to the development of Christian doctrine, we are also saying something very important about the relationship between faith and reason because as the Christian faith develops in its content, what we're saying is that reason had always already, in the, the Platonic and Aristotelian traditions, had always already anticipated this faith, as it were. It wasn't something alien to it, it was a continuation of it, even though in a, you know, in a much heightened key, as it were. Mm -hmm. I suppose that my own instinct would be to say that to, to, you know, broadly, I would think I agree with you on faith and reason, but that it's very hard to ever be in a position to know that this Greek tradition is the best, or the only, or, or better than other traditions, particularly because in some ways, both of us are in it. So we, we aren't in a position to step outside this particular uh, cultural development, historical tradition, philosophical tradition, and say, I think it's very hard to step outside it and say we know that this is a better fit with Christianity yeah. than something else because we simply don't have that perspective. So my instinct would be to say it's really helpful to notice all the ways in which you know, this tradition of reason r reaches towards and um, helps and supports what Christian faith must do, but that I have no basis for um, too much confidence that there might not be um, some other tradition in a completely different cultural context um, that could also serve that purpose. Or perhaps even in our own context, it's possible to imagine someone, well, I'm, I'm not too sure about whether there could be sort of radically new philosophical developments that leave quite a lot of the Neoplatonic tradition behind and yet themselves could become the handmaid of theology. I'm, I'm less confident about that, but I, yeah. I do wonder. I wonder whether it's possible I, I certainly agree that one can't take a, a kind of a traditional stance and look at all this and say, uh, you know, from some ultra neutral perspective and say, yes, that would fit, that wouldn't fit. Yes, of course, we, we can't do that. Um, I wonder whether we, it would be very advisable to make history, uh, as it were, incidental in that sense. Um, I mean, the, as you quite rightly say, the fact of the matter is uh, that historically, uh, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy, the Hebraic tradition and Christian theology all get melded together. And there wouldn't be a situation in which one could unpick all of those and then try and fit Christian theology with, say, Confucianism or a different kind of tradition and say, well, does that fit? Because, you know, as a matter of fact, Christian theology is simply <laughs> melded with uh, Platonic and Aristotelian thought because we understand Christian doctrine, for example, the Incarnation, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, 
using Greek categories. Um, and we've got no other way of doing that. We have no other way of doing that. So I certainly wouldn't want to embark on trying to meld Christian theology with Confucianism. But I also would be a little nervous about saying that nobody could do so. And if someone was immersed in the categories and patterns of thought of a different culture and a different yeah. philosophical yeah. tradition, I'd be very nervous. They would obviously have to learn enough about the Greek tradition to make sense of what went on if they're going to maintain any kind of continuity with the early church, let's say. Yeah. But I'd be nervous to say they couldn't do something quite different with a different set of yeah. categories. Um, I think the, the guiding model of... Um, my own theological education, which I'm not necessarily committed to, but the, the instinct that I've been trained into is to see philosophy on an analogy with a language. You, you can't do theology without language and probably without the importation of a philosophical language of some sort. But there's the question of whether one is uniquely privileged. Now, maybe that's too weak an understanding and doesn't give a strong enough understanding to the role of reason, as you rightly said, yeah, in the think, relation of yeah. faith and reason. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Perhaps we've got to the point where we can say there's at most maybe only a hair's breadth difference between us with slightly more worry on my part about being confident yes. that this is the only. But both of us would agree on quite a few things about the importance of, if, of, of this, historically, of this philosophical tradition, yes. about the danger of any sharp divide between philosophy and theology. Yes, I think I think the other thing to say is that we will probably agree I think on what kind of philosophies don't fit or work. Um, particularly certain kinds that arose in the modern period that suddenly begin to scrutinize Christian doctrine uh, but scrutinize a particular kind of Christian doctrine as propositional if you like um, to use one of George Limbach's phrases. Um, and you know, of certain Cartesian variety, uh, and then moving into the 20th century as well. Well, I think that's as far as we can go for today, and perhaps on another day we can return to this question of, of distinctively modern distortions. Thank you very much, Simon.